It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want it there. I'm good. Thank you, though. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. I just said that we can be live. Can everybody hear us all online? I see you can hear us. There's nothing on chat. Nobody's complaining. Okay. Good. So I uh, assume everybody can hear us. We we'll start in a couple of minutes. Uh, I think cookies are important. <laughs> <laughs> it's like lapsing. <laughs> 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 I'm 
Quantum information so yeah, you are lucky that right? a lot of people right? will hear a lot about quantum, I assume, <laughs> of quantum information in general. Um, so Michael did his uh, undergrad work at the Black University, and then after spending multiple years, at the, he did a PhD at uh, RIT. Um, and so after that, he's back to Rome. And, and, he was and today, his talk would be on quantum coding integrated circuit. Things that you're going to see maybe the next five to ten years, if I can keep it. Or now. Or now. <laughs> okay. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Is the mic actually picking it up? Yes. Okay. Cool. So I'm Mike. Um, I go by Mike, so that's fine. Uh, I don't know what your guys' policy is for questions, but if you have one, ask. If you don't, that's fine, but it doesn't matter if it's in the middle of the talk. If you're really excited about something, just raise your hand. Yeah. I know there, this is just a quick one. No more nonsense than that, because I promise. All good. There's a lot of the surplus of people named Michael has just been increasing over the past few decades. What was your like nickname in high school to kind of get over that? <laughs> so mine was actually my last name, which is Fanto. And it was, uh, there was a funny, I'll, I'll give a funny story behind it. So it was my last name and my first initial. So I was always referred to as the Phantom. <laughs> and then it was solidified when I started with the government because they would print out every time you printed out a government document, it has to be attributed to someone. So it would print out your first five of your last name and your first initial. So every document I ever printed, it would say this document has been printed by the Phantom. <laughs> so it was further solidified. Any more? Okay. So, as I said, I'm going to, I'll go through this. There's a lot of slides, but stop. We'll talk about some of them. Some of them are pretty pictures, uh, but there's a, there's a lot of opportunities for collaboration, students to come, but we'll get into this. As I said, I'm going to talk about QPix. That's my background. Um, I sit in Rome, New York. So two hours east of here, uh, another two hours if you want to go to the AIM Photonics Fabrication Facility. If you want to go up to the Adirondacks, you kind of pass through Rome. If you want to go see a giant Air Force base, go to Rome. Not all leads would lead there because I-90 doesn't, but field saying it does. Okay, so let's see if all this actually connects and works. No, nope. it did a second ago. Oh yeah, never mind. Zoom doesn't work with that. Now it does. Okay. So if you take anything away from this talk at all today, this main point <laughs> with quantum, every single photon counts whether it's the photon you want, 
whether it's the photon you don't want, everyone counts. Think back to old analog computing. We, we want phase stability. This is computation through interference. So all these things, path length, everything matters. We're going to make large number of two qubits. The government is not going to make a quantum computer, but there's a lot of people that are. So you need to make large numbers of qubits, or you need to make large number of two qubits that are not distinguish are indistinguishable, distinguishable or indistinguishable, uh, or distinguishable, indistinguishable. You want to go back and forth between them. The other thing is, from a photonic standpoint, you want to be able to make these things. You want to be able to take a student. CAD something up, make it, and then have it fabricated. But you want that device to be the same as another one that you make, or some another student makes a different one. So you need some process design kit that you can just go to a foundry and have these things made. Um, so one of the things that I will say, so the Air Force is partnered with AIM Photonics, and we are releasing a quantum PDK to the, to the US next year. Um, so that will be open to everyone. But if we're going to talk about quantum and we're going to talk about DOD applications, where, where do they break down? So the first one is if you have one qubit, you can do timing okay, or sensing. So the first nearest term applications are timing and sensing. Like If you don't have GPS, you need some other way to uh, sense what's around you. If you have a couple qubits, you can start doing common networking. And when you start getting the large number of the qubits, then you start thinking about computation. And as I said, the government's not going to do that part of it because you've got companies like Honeywell, Google, PsyQuantum, Xanadu. They're all doing that. They've got a lot of customer backing. Let them do it. There's two other things that not many people talk about. One is enabling technologies. So who's going to make the picks? Who's going to make the transducers? Who's going to make the low noise electronics, the low noise cryogenics, the small form factor systems? That's all really important. The other thing that's even more important than this is all of you. It is. You need people that are quantum smart. You need people that are science smart. We need the workforce to be able to develop this, and we're not going to be able to do it without you guys. Hands down. Okay, so what is the Air Force doing? Or what is the DOD doing? If we're not doing computation, at least in Rome, we're doing networking. So it's the, it's the middle stage for computation. It's essentially connecting small scale quantum computers and processing in between them and transmitting information. What are we doing it with? We've decided to bite off probably the hardest problem you can think of. Why not, right? So if you're gonna transmit quantum information, you're only going to do it with certain level of qubits. Photons are really the only one to do it with. So we have a photon group, and that's the group that I lead. But you're not going to store photons. You just can't. Um, uh, so you need some solid state version to store them into. So trapped ions, nitrogen vacancies, defects, quantum dots, all of these other things that have, have levels where you can actually store into. Then you need some type of fast processing. Now, all of these systems can do the other pieces, but they don't do them all well. So if you want to do fast processing, superconducting electronic circuits are pretty good at it. But now the hardest part about all of this I want to maintain quantum information between photons, between ions, and between superconducting qubits, which means I need to transduce that quantum information between each of the qubit modalities. Why? Because if you go classical, you lose the properties of quantum. And if you want to remain secure or you want to remain 
by the fundamental security of quantum mechanics, you have to stay quantum. Doing this transduction and connecting all these qubits is very, very difficult. Some are easier than others, but it's still difficult. So how are we doing it? And what do we have to be able to do it? Well, as I said, it's not just us. It's all our collaborators. It's all our students. It's all our postdocs, researchers everywhere else. And we've realized that. And we know that right off the bat. So we have our labs that are inside our gate. So that's our US citizens. That's just, it's a government laboratory. We can't fight that battle. We have our test labs that are outside. These ones are government. Again, we can't do anything about it, but we've got some test facilities for drones and we can put stuff out there. This is the new piece. So this just opened in November. So it's 3000 square feet of laboratory that's outside our gate. Students, non-US citizens, non-US collaborators can get in and work with us on this stuff. This is a huge step forward for the government to be able to do that. So students, postdocs, pre-doctoral or already in your uh, thesis work can come to work with us. We take, uh, the lab takes anywhere from around about 150 to 200 students a summer for internships, up to like 60 professors. Uh, and then there's co-ops and then there's all these other uh, longer term um, internships. So those all exist and citizenship doesn't matter, which is nice. So that's a hurdle that we've gotten been able to get over. This is what the building, well, cartoon rendering of what the building looks like. Uh, this was an old control tower for the Air Force. And to give you a scale for how big these labs are, this is a hangar for a B-52 bomber. <laughs> So a good chunk of this is our lab. That, that's a large lab. Uh, and it's got all three qubit technologies in it and ready for people to come in, work with us. All of that exists. But let's get into the, actually the science of this. Why are we talking about qubits and why are we talking about heterogeneous integration? Again, think back to every photon counts. Think back to all of this as um, phase stability, everything else. So if we're going to make a quantum system and we're going to make a quantum network, what's, the thing, what's something we can't have? We can't have amplifiers. No cloning theorem states that we cannot amplify a quantum si signal. So what do we have to do? We actually have another piece of equipment, which is called a quantum repeater. And a quantum repeater is essentially a small scale quantum computer. It takes in a signal, measures it, and re-encodes that information on a different qubit. Okay, so if you're thinking about that, you have something that's a memory, just like a normal computer. You have a memory, you have a processing unit, and you have a data transmission. So you're thinking solid state qubits, so trapped ions, let's say, some sources, which are, let's say, spontaneous four-wave mixing in like silicon or silicon nitride, and then some processing, some, some array of interferometers or array of uh, mux under modulators or disk modulators or rings. And then you have to hit the grid. Why? Corning put a lot of money in the global infrastructure for the telecom grid. There's no way that the Air Force, the government, or anyone else is going to have enough money for someone to change the telecom grid. It's just not going to happen. So if we're going to transmit, you have to go either to O-band or you have to go to SCNL. No question about it. So from here, you can think, this is the grid. I, I don't have any other choice. Okay. Well, what already exists? Well, they're not miniature. <laughs> they're not miniature at all. So you see uh, vacuum chambers for like trapped ion systems. They're kind of like this. They're big. You have frequency conversion crystals. Now we have them as waveguides or we can start doing it on chip. Great. Uh, large interferometric arrays. Anyone that's worked in an optics lab or a comm lab, you've seen mock senders. You've seen lithium niobate mock senders. They're big. So here's an array of 88 of them on a chip. It's one millimeter by four millimeters. That thing would take up a four by eight optical table normally. 
and you would pull out every single hair that exists on your head trying to align it. I don't want either of those things to happen. And then you want some type of sources. So we take a step back. Okay, if we're going to do this in integrated photonics, what are our options? What does our landscape look like and what do we have to work with? So we start looking at, this is a non non uh, inclusive fully inclusive list but just some of them so you got your solid state qubits down here ytterbium strontium barium nvs you got your quantum dot regime you got some of your solid state uh memory so like erbium three plus erbium in like vanadium crystals got ytterbium out there and then you've got your superconducting circuitry which would put you in the microwave so what do we have in our toolkit right now for integrated photonics? And where do these things classify? Well, so here's your quantum memories. These are your flying qubits, essentially your transmission ones. And then your processors. Again, they can do, each of them can do the other's tasks, but it's what are they good for? What are they best at? So if we look at what's out there in the fab, we got silicon. So we got SOI, we know that. That gets us to about 1,100. Silicon nitride gets us to around 400. Silicon carbide gets us around to like 380. Lithium niobate around 320, 300. Aluminum nitride, 197. And then sapphire gets you way down there, huge bang down. So they're all good materials. Which ones are really in the fab though? Silicon, silicon nitride, aluminum nitride's in there already as passivated for high voltage electronics. Lithium niobate's not, silicon carbide kind of is, and then sapphire can be at points. So we have some things to pull from. So if we look at a time scale of what we've had, you start looking at especially integrated photonics has been around since the 80s. No question about that. You start before here, and it's all e-beam lithography and everything done. And you're, I mean, I started there and it's like, you're happy when you get one device that works and you publish it and it's great. And then you try to make another one and it doesn't work. And you keep trying a couple more months and another one works and you're good. But to be able to move from e-beam litho to pretty much full-scale wafers of integrated photonic devices for quantum applications. So we've been doing a couple different runs right now. Yes, I'm kind of a nerd, we named these. So first one was Dr. Manhattan, you know, Watchmen, Venom and Carnage. I don't think I need to explain where they came from, but Carnage will be the follow on spawn to Venom for that run, so yes. I do like superheroes. Um, but the point is, the results from Carnage give everyone in the whole community integrated photonics for quantum. You can now go to uh, essentially aim photonics and buy quantum devices or what you would normally get out of like an AFOSR grant or an NSF grant instead of the ridiculous cost that it costs to develop these full wafers at for us at least and to give you a scale why does it cost so much if anyone in here is anyone here has done their own litho or okay so this venom has 52 masks huh. to do it huh. that's not fun i don't and i i hope no one has to do that so but now you won't have to do that, so that's good. So on one of these chips, you take, you take one of these wafers, here's your reticle. It's got, uh, so a, a reticle has 12 chips. Each of those chips can be diced into six. Each of those six chips can have between 20 to 40 experiments on it. So you're, you're pretty much set. So we've got single photon sources, we've got, qubits for and sources and circuits for uh, solid state. So all your visible photonics. 
heterogeneous integration. So this is nonlinear crystals. So this is PPKTP actually butted with these QPICs. So this is work that Stefan is doing over at RIT. Uh, flip chip bonding of lithium nibate onto these sub wavelengths. If you want to work with that, MEMS nested arrays, giant arrays of photonic crystals. There were some fun stories about making those, and then trenches for actually adding in other materials, stuff that you can't even get, or you want to isolate heat. And again, it's all to be about how to get the photons and how to get the ones you want. So we'll go through, this is an interesting story with it. If anyone's taken nonlinear optics, they know this. We'll go over it really quickly, but essentially look at the polarizability, but in an input wave, factor everything out. You started with omega, you end up with two omega, okay? So we've just made second harmonic generation. The reverse process happens for also making correlated photons for quantum. You can take a high energy photon and split it into two. That's an entangled pair. If you have, if it's a second order nonlinearity because the crystal is symmetric, centrosymmetric or non-centrosymmetric, it's spontaneous parametric down conversion. If it is centrosymmetric, like silicon or other materials, it's the third order nonlinearity and it's spontaneous four wave mixing. Okay. These are the two ways that my group standardly makes uh, these integrated sources. So, what do we have? We, we typically use fun, spontaneous four wave mixing. Why? It's really nice, it's intuitive in silicon, has a really strong third order of nonlinearity. It's also, you have this waveguide that has roughly all the same color in it. So you're adding in two waves and you're producing two waves. The easiest if these are all the same color. Energy conservation states that two in must equal two out in this case. And if you're making a waveguide, you don't have that supports all the same colors. There is a caveat that comes in later, but we'll get to that. So we make these sources. This is just a long spiral waveguide. So if one thing I'll, I'll say, actually, let me just go back to this one. I just want you to note one thing. So you've got the nonlinear susceptibility, so that's innate to the material, but then you've got the electric field. <laughs> and it's not only the electric field itself, it's the interaction length and it's the intensity of the electric field. So if you can pulse that light or you can confine it to a device like a resonator or you can confine it to a very short or very narrow waveguide, you really win out. So here we've got centimeter long waveguides that are 500 nanometers wide. So huge interaction length, and you can produce very good uh, photon sources. And it's really easy. It's just drawing a spiral, nothing more than that. But you can do better. So you can use, actually use a cavity. So in this case, we're using micro ring resonators. Light gets trapped in this resonator, goes around a thousand times or something like that. So you keep interacting with the material, keep generating up field, you keep generating sources. Um, and you can see they're really compact. They're really easy to design. For quantum applications, this is a photon source. For spectroscopic applications, this is a Lorentzian filter, a narrow line with Lorentzian filter. For COM applications, this is a mux demux system, an add drop filter. So one thing that you'll find also with a lot of quantum applications is it's not quantum in the device's nature necessarily. The device is multifunction. I mean, if you think of these mux ender arrays, and we'll get to them later, for us, it's a processor. For telecom community, it's an end by end non blocking switch. For the neuromorphic community, it is a neuron. So 
they're multi-use. Quantum just is the squeaky wheel. We're the ones that need the lowest loss. We're the ones that need the highest functionality. So because we're the squeaky wheel, we're the ones that get heard. And unfortunately, everyone else benefits from it too. So we've got, what do we have to think about? Well, if you have a resonator, you build up a uh, field in the cavity, great. But if, God bless you, if you only have uh, a single bus, in this case, we have two, we have a double bus ring. Yeah. So in the previous slide, yeah. uh, you have the bottom that, uh, that these rings are used for the photon generation that you explained, but also what do you mean by photon help? Oh, okay, certainly. So if you, you're gonna generate two photons in this, and unless you're actually triggering with like a pulsed excitation, a clock, um, you don't know when those photons are gonna come out because it's still probabilistic in nature. You know it can only happen when there's light in the cavity or excitation, but you don't know necessarily if it's gonna happen 100% of the time. So it's, it's roughly, a good order of magnitude is for every 10 to the seventh to 10 to the 10th photons you put in this, you get one pair out. So if you're generating two photons, you can spectrally split. So if we're looking at energy conservation, so let's say I pump right at 1560. This resonance would be the red shifted or the blue shifted one, and this would be the red shifted. Those would be the two energy conserving resonances that would generate right off the bat. So if you want to guarantee when you're getting a single photon, that's called heralding. So what you would do is you would spectrally split these. So send one to one port, send one to another, and detect one of them. So you will be using one three resonator in an analog configuration to separate the heralded photon. Yes. Heralding one. Yep. Yep. And you you clock on one and then you know the other one is a single photon. Yep. So you can make these in microring resonators, but if you don't collect the other port, you essentially have a 50% loss. It's just scattering that comes off of it. Also, in quantum applications, you're looking for correlations. So you're looking for two photons, unless you're heralding off of this one. So if the rest of your circuit where you want this photon to go, if both of them don't go there, it's like none of them went there because it doesn't matter. So this is where, again, every photon counts. So if I put in input here, light goes into the ring, the rest of my circuit, let's say, is over here. Both photons can go that way, and I get both entangled photons off. If they go over here, my circuit doesn't see them. Or in this configuration or this configuration, it doesn't help me. So it's not even 50% loss. It's 20% of the 25% of the time the light goes where I want it. That's a that's a problem. So can we do better? And the answer is yes. So we proved it. So you can change the gap. So you can make it harder for the light to get in, but easier for the light to get out. So you increase the gap on this side, you decrease the gap on this side. You have lots of pump light. We got milliwatts. We, we can throw some photons away. But here you're generating femtowatts. So you don't want to lose those. So you can actually increase this gap and you can prove that as I get this gap closer and this gap farther away, I can get to what's called unity coincidence efficiency. And coincidence efficiency just means the two photons that I want go out the port that I want. 100% means, or a factor of one means, both the photons are leaving where I want them to. So the problem is, see how much power it takes? If you wanna do that, it takes 10 times the power. Can we do better? And the answer is yes. But um, a couple of our colleagues, and some of you know John Sipe and Marco, but 
uh, and Zach was one of the founders of Xanadu, so another photon computing company, said, you can't do it for free. You can't get high heralding efficiency and uh, essentially a good photon source, but you can. So what you really want is you want something that looks like a photon source, but a high efficiency photon source for two wavelengths. So let's reach into our tool bag. What do we got? We have mock sender interferometers. So if you look at them, they have a sinusoidal transfer function. And if you make the wavelength, if you make the two legs independent from each other, they have a frequency dependence. What, what else do we have? We've got micro ring resonators, so we can trap the light. We can also, if you look at it, it looks like Lorentzian. So combine them, why not? So if you combine them, and what I would hide is draw a line right through the center here. That's one port into a mock sender. That's the other port. There's your directional coupler. There's one leg. There's the other leg of the mock sender. There's the directional coupler. And then one out and one out. So what you have now is an asymmetric length mock sender. What does that do for you? It gives you a frequency dependence on the wavelengths that pass through it and don't. So what is it? It's an interferometric mirror. It's an on-chip mirror. And then the other side is the same thing. So what does it do? Here's your resonances that would normally exist. One side, you tune to reflect the pump. The other side, you tune to reject the pump. So if you do that, your pump goes in one side and doesn't leave. And the other side happens, your signal neither, your entangled photons that are generated in here can't leave any other port than the determined port that they want. So you go from having, let's, we'll just go to this one. You go from having cross terms and low generation rate to high generation rate and no cross terms anymore. So you've changed your coincidence efficiency from worst case was 25% to unity, which is kind of nice. So that problem's pretty much been solved. Then you can improve the device, which we did, um, just some thermal phase shifters. And then another way to, we're not only doing nonlinear optics on chip, we're also doing another way to Right. Generate, uh, generate photons is quantum dots. So we're working with Dirk Englund and then Ido Walks over at University of Maryland and MIT. So this is photonic crystal arrays with quantum dots in them. These are silicon and silicon nitride waveguides. Put the devices on and you can get very good single photon emission deterministically on quantum dots. But in any of these cases, we run into a problem. And this, again, goes back to my statement of every photon counts. And this is one of them where you don't want them to count. So you're pumping these things with milliwatts of power. That, there's a milliwatts of power going into this chip. You are generating single photons. So you are at the femtowatt level. The problem is your detectors are set up for femtowatts of detection, but they're gonna see milliwatts if you're not careful. You will absolutely blind your detectors. So what do you need to do on that chip? You need 120 to 150 dB of filtering, which is not easy. It's, it's extremely difficult. And anything that you can think of to do this is going to help. It gets to the point where you're thinking of waveguides and scattering, single photon scattering off of other devices. So if you were to take an infrared camera, and I know probably plenty of you have seen it, and you look at a device, you can see it. 
That means it's scattering. I'd love to see an integrated photonic device where I couldn't see it under an infrared camera. But sadly, we do. It also makes it a lot easier to align if you can actually see it. So we're looking at, sorry, insertion loss. So you couple light to this chip. That light doesn't couple into the waveguide. Where does it go? It goes into the slab mode. It goes into the glass. It scatters around that chip. You got to get rid of it. You've got height variation. So your mode leaks out. You've got Rayleigh scattering, which is lambda to the oh, one over the lambda to the four scattering. So it gets really bad as you go to short wavelengths. This is another thing that a lot of people and some of our stuff we didn't even have to think about until we got to these lower losses is every time you make a mode transition, you scatter into another mode. Sometimes those modes couple where you don't think they're gonna couple. And we'll talk about that in a second. So one way to do that is actually have the foundry make a rule so you can't do it again. And this was one of the chips. There's now a rule that you can't do this anymore. Um, so if we look at one of these chips for filtering, here's your photon source. It's just the Mickey Mouse one that we showed. Here's a bunch of filters. All of these little silver blocks are germanium. So if you think back to normal 3.5 uh, materials, germanium is a good, uh, it's used for detectors, right? It absorbs photons really well. If you don't connect it to anything, it still absorbs photons well. You just don't read out current. Why are we using it? It's a shield. Photons hit it, they don't go anywhere. They can't scatter around the chip. Okay, so we put on eight filters, which between here, we should have gotten 200 dB. We didn't. Why? We got 57. Can so you measure 200 dB? What? Can Sorry. you measure a loss of 200 dB? It's extremely difficult. To how, how much power do you have to begin with? So we have uh, the dynamic range of our, well, we should have had that. We can measure 150. So that's as much as we can measure. But what you typically would do is, uh, I don't know, 20 dB uh, out of an attenuate, out of an amplifier, and then single photons are going to be femtolots. So you you have the range. Most detectors don't. If you don't, if you're looking at a normal detector, yeah, you don't have the range. If you have superconducting detectors, you can get it. But the main point is we didn't get it. And the reason why, mode conversion. So TM comes in. So all your devices, at least on our chip, were set up for transverse electric, TE mode. And our filters were set up for TE, which means there's a very small gap between your waveguide and your filter. Well, TM has a very, very strong coupling. So if you have a really short gap and you transition to TM mode anywhere, it will make the gap. It doesn't matter. So we designed everything now for TM. You generate in TE because it's a dispersion flat regime and you can get energy conservation. And then you go from that and you immediately transverse to TM, all your filterings in TM, and then you traverse back to TE later on. So that's where we're sitting. We have that chip, and now we're starting to test that one. So a lot of these are just gonna be quicker slides in the end. Uh, so these are some of our information processors. So these are just the large arrays of mock senders. So usually folded design, just space, because these things are huge. Also, we're looking at it from a packaging standpoint. We want low connector loss. We don't want to have multiple interfaces, single interface. So here's a package one of eager array. And this is what we use to modify our signal. So each of these uh, phase shifters, you can do push-pull configuration, and you can add 
uh, amplitude and phase variation to that quantum signal. So that is your processor. Yeah. MEMS. And so why would we go to MEMS? It came back to another reason of photons that we don't want. So we look at, if you're, look at it from a semiconductor standpoint. So if you have a semiconductor and you interface it with a metal, that junction generates defects, right? Bless you. Bless you. What happens when you take a current and you slam electrons into that junction? It produces photons. And it turns out it produces redshifted photons that are very broadband, but very bright. So when we first did this device, your typical PIN structures or PN structures that go across the waveguide, which were coupled to the waveguide, without light incident on this device, it would saturate your superconducting detectors. Just electrically turn it on, it was essentially a flashlight to, to that device. And we're still trying to figure out, a bun there's a couple groups that have seen this effect and we're still trying to figure out what is exactly the reason. But it seems like it's hot electrons that are hitting that interface. So don't touch the interface, just get the light away from it, get anything that can generate photons away because it's just gonna add to your noise floor. So use MEMS. So we've worked with, uh, AIM, and we worked with uh, Stefan over at RIT and a group at Naval Research Lab. These are MEMS phase shifters. So this is two legs of a MOX ender, the directional couplers over here and over here. And then these are what's called gradient field. So think back to the physics experiment of what happens when you put a dielectric inside a capacitor, two plates of a capacitor, it's pulled in. So if you start pulling a high index material towards a waveguide, what does it do? It pulls the mode, it modifies the mode. So you're adding an index difference. But you're not adding heat, you're not adding uh, photon generation to that waveguide now, you're just adding an index change. So it's a very passive way to do it. And this is one of the reasons that we went down that route. And uh, we've been able to do this and, and show it in the foundry. But then, Oh, I'm going to uh, Next is getting rid of heat, okay? So what happens when you heat up metal? What happens when you heat up a device? What happens to its length? Changes, yeah, exactly. What happens when you have a nicely balanced interferometer and you put a hot match stick near it? It's not nice anymore. <laughs> and if you want to quantify that, Here's a thermal phase shifter. Over here was a ring resonator. So nice narrow line width filter locked directly to a wavelength. You heat this thing up, it glows nicely. Not exactly glows nicely, but you start, depending on how far you're away from it, it's gonna throw you off resonance, which is kind of detrimental. Um, one of, the, one of the reasons, why don't you just go electro-optic? We don't have electro-optic on these chips. That's one of the reasons that we're looking at heterogeneous integration of aluminum nitride and lithium niobate and polymers for electro-optic. But right now we don't have that. So if you wanna actually model this, here's your two waveguides for your heater. Um, here's one, if you actually put an air gap in it. So cut underneath the device takes 50 milliwatt or 60 milliwatts to do a pi phase shift with just a normal device. It takes three, you do an air gap. So you really concentrated the heat. So we did it. Um, here's your mock sender, here's another mock sender, heat this one up, see what happens to this one. Before you can see it's going through its constructive and destructive oscillation phases as you're heating it up after, doesn't do anything. But this was done just in the RIT cleaner. So we just take xenon difluoride and, well, HF and cut through the oxide and then xenon difluoride and cut out the silicon. Now this is the name. So this will be available, I think, this summer to everyone. Um, 
Let's make a giant hole. <laughs> here's, your, here's your disk modulator. Here's your pads. Here's your waveguide. So you can kind of see the disk right in there. There's the electrical pads. Waveguide goes out on each, and you can see they would follow there. So this giant Grand Canyon is now going to isolate anything you want from anything else. Mike, what is the foundry used for the edge? So this is actually a name. Yeah, I mean, what, what do they use physically for the edge? Oh, uh, it's, it's the same DIA. So it, yeah. So it's actually done in the same step as DIA. So it's Bosch in this case. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. That's how we get rid of some of the photons. What about in the regime where light doesn't want to work in silicon nitride or silicon? We can't use silicon in the visible because we're below the band gap. Uh, we can use it for detectors, and we have, but not for um, uh, photon uh, carrying. So this is our work with uh, Naval Research Lab. So here's visible wavelength photonics through AIM. Um, why is it blue and red? Well, one of the atoms that we work with is barium, and barium's transition lines, one of them is 493, so it's a really nice teal color, and 650 is the other one, which is right in the middle of the red spectrum. Um, so, great. But the other thing I'll say is, these are all the wavelengths that we want to work with. And this is just for barium. And what is one of the things you want to do? Well, has anyone seen an ion trap before? Okay. Does anyone know, have an idea of what one is? Okay. Okay. So essentially, an ion trap is how to make a crystal in free space. That's essentially what it is. What you're going to do is you're going to take a sample of atoms, you're going to ionize them, and you're going to have some electric potential, some DC and some rotating RF. And what you want to do is you'll ionize these things, and then you want to catch them in these potential wells. Okay, And then you're going to also have lasers, which are going to cool them to their ground state, and they're going to sit there. And they're going to sit there at an exact spacing based on both their interactions between each other and the interaction between the fields that are surrounding them. So what you end up with is a non-uniform spacing of essentially atoms, closer in the middle, farther out on the ends. So in optics, if you wanna make a non-uniform spacing, it's kind of annoying. So like you can use uh, AOMs, acousto-optic modulators, but they want to make symmetric spacings. Or you got to play games for them not to. So why not just use waveguides? Why, you already know what the spacing is of the trap. You've made it. And you know what the atoms are going to be spaced at. So this is not an array of atoms. This is an array of, this is an image of single photon uh, outputs from a waveguide splitter. And this is at the spacing of the ion trap. One of the things I want to say is best in the world right now is 45 dB of extinction. That's not 45 dB. So these are brand, pretty much brand new results. We've beaten the best in the world by 15 dB. And we're actually at the point where these aren't real nulls. We can't measure them. So we actually have to now get to the point where our detectors aren't good enough. What we're going to have to do is actually put it on single atoms. And that will tell us where the actual nulls are. So instead of using a detector, actually use a single barium atom to see where it stops getting excited. And we know those positions exactly. So that's the good part. So this is really exciting. Also, how do we interact strongly with other materials? Well, you make these really high intensity cavities. So one of them that we're working with Dirk England over at MIT on, again, is photonic crystals. 
they're doing it for spatial light modulated spatial light modulation, but you can do it for uh, nonlinear interactions and materials. That's no problem. So these large arrays, uh, photonic crystals, they're actually membranes in the end. It kind of looks like if you took a slice of honeycomb, it's, it's actually really, really pretty. But one of the things was, can we make these in a foundry? Can we make these at large scale? Can we make these with a whole wafer full of a million Q? And the answer is yes, we can. So here's one of the cavities. This is an L3 cavity. L3 meaning it's missing three holes and or an L4 thirds or you know, there's the L3 again, L7. And they all have not creative names, but yeah, pretty much across the way for pretty much all a million roughly or round up from the 700. But yeah, you can start making these things. Why do you want to do this? Why would you even think of doing this? If you want to take light out of a quantum dot and you want to confine it, you can put that quantum dot over one of these cavities and you can confine that light extremely tightly. Or you want to do an evanescent interaction with a nonlinear material. That field strength in that cavity is extremely high. It's extremely low mode volume. So you're going to really interact with whatever you place on it. So this is one way to do it. And then, since we're the Air Force, we got to take it out of the field. Our laboratory, our final laboratory is not the lab. It's can it survive on a tank? Can it survive on a UAV? Can it survive on a plane? Um, so packaging, we've been doing a lot with it. So this was just some stuff we did with uh, how to connect different splices of fiber to get really low, essentially, uh, uniform loss. Uh, this is something that working with AIM Photonics. So this is actually the new edge coupler um, that is going into AIM. So it's a 10 micron mode spot. And if you calculate out math, you've got two microns above the oxide, uh, two microns of oxide below the waveguide before you hit the handle wafer. You've got a mode field of 10 microns. So that means from the waveguide core to the outside, it's five microns. Five microns is bigger than two microns. So three microns of your mode was actually going into the slab and you were just sucking in light and losing it. So get rid of the slab, just cut it out. So for the edge couplers, you actually remove part of the handle wafer. So get rid of the high index material, your silicon nitride waveguide sits here. You've got more than enough. You've got over 10 microns of space and you efficiently couple. And why, if you look at these chips under like uh, Tom, like under your key ends or something, that's why you'll see this trench because that's actually where the silicon's missing, the, the handle wafer's missing. But this is gonna be the new edge coupler that's on, on your guys' chips when you get them. And that's the reason. The other thing is make sure it's a vertical edge. So if you're gonna butt up against this, a fiber, that it actually connects well. Or packaging, how do you need the electronics to mate? Great, wire bond it. But then what's next? So you saw some of the materials go beyond the violet. So silicon nitride stops at 400. What if we wanna go into the ultraviolet? What if we want electro-optic materials? What if we want something for high power handling? This is where aluminum nitride comes in. So aluminum nitride, large refractive index comparable to silicon nitride in that sense. Band gap's pretty big. It's uh, nonlinear, so we can actually, depending on the configuration, we can get a good electro-optic uh, coefficient and uh, nonlinear susceptibility from it. But it gives us, that modulation capability. It works from the ultraviolet. So this is actually at 369. This is at 455, 650, and then infrared. Um, so it's a great material for that. It handles watts of power in a waveguide. So just imagine you've got a 300 nanometer waveguide that's carrying a watt to a watt and a half of power. Pretty good nonlinear coefficient and interaction you get from that. 
adding in electronics. So one of the biggest things that you'll find is when you actually start controlling these devices, good photonic systems don't necessarily make good electronic systems. Why? Dopant, migration, everything else that's associated with good electronics, all your diffusion, that gets into the waveguides, it's lost. So you got to be careful when you put the start putting the electronics back in that those dopants don't get into the waveguides. Um, so it's been careful to put the electronics back in. Um, also, so we've been able to drop the loss to around 0.25 dB per centimeter. This typically was around three. So three dB, if you're not used to log scale, three dB is half your light loss. Silicon nitrides down there, trenches. So now we can start putting in polymers, solid state qubits, MEMS, vertical junctions so you can make your modulators. And then, as I said, aluminum nitride. And if you want to start doing electro-optic combs, mode lock lasers, soliton generation, play with the root velocity dispersion. We're adding in a third layer so we can start doing that. And then just as a summary, uh, the biggest thing, as I said, is uh, we have this being released to the public. First runs will come on this summer and then uh, this coming summer and then 2024 spring, it's open to everyone. And then also, uh, as I said, we're open for collaboration, students, please, uh, faculty, anyone, just get in contact with us. And with that, I'll, I think I went a couple minutes over anyways. Sorry. Well, that was a very nice talk, and I'm sure there are some questions around here. So please uh, go ahead and anyone have any questions? Uh, this is a simple question. How do you grab atoms or ions inside those waveguides? Areas of wind? It's tricky. Um, so typically what you end up doing is what's called surface traps. So you've got your waveguides, you've got your waveguiding layer, and what you end up doing is grading couplers for light to the surface. And then on the surface, you have this electro design, and that's what's trapping the atoms above the surface. So you actually... are literally floating above the chip and then you're coupling light up to them. The other way to do it is to dig into the chip and then couple them in and trap them in that way. Now, there's a couple groups around there that are doing slightly different. They're using the ions in a matrix already. So they'll take like erbium or, so, and why do they like erbium? Um, erbium has a transition at roughly 1532 to 1536 for the telecom band, so it's a memory there. But why don't they do it the other way? Because it's three plus. So you would actually have to triply ionize it to get it to sit in the trap well. That's kind of annoying. So what you can do is you can actually embed it in a host crystal like vanadium or vanadate crystal, something like that and use that as the memory. In that case, what you would do is you'd actually take your optical waveguide, you'd remove all the material from around it, or as much as you can to delocalize that mode as much as, expose as much to that mode as possible. Couple that crystal evanescently to the guide, and then you'd couple that way. But typically, yeah, you just have these traps and the, the ions just float above the surface and, if you Google like um, IonQ or Honeywell, they've got some cool videos and you can see them shuttling the ions just back and forth above the chips. It's pretty neat to see. Yeah, yeah no problem. Um, for processes like four-way mixing where you have the pump signal, signal and I think all the similar band, yeah. is there a concern for overlapping long scattered photons at all? Yes, yeah. Um, so in, and it's, it is, and it's not necessarily where you think. Um, one of the biggest culprits of it is actually the optical fiber to get to the chip. 
because uh, that's going to be broadband raw money mission that's just going to go everywhere. On the chip, silicon's crystalline. You know exactly where the Raman transition is going to be, so you don't worry about that. Silicon nitride, yeah, it might do broadband. The hardest part is now filtering all those colors that are roughly the same. But yeah, Raman is something that we do have to worry about. Yeah, the good part and the saving grace is the quality factors of these resonators are roughly between 50,000 to 100,000. So some of them we can get away with pumping with like 100 microwatts. And then it's not as bad. But certainly Raman to the chip is uh, definitely something that we have to worry about. And one of the reasons is putting gain on chip to get rid of that. Can you use spontaneous Fourier mixing to seed another one? Yeah. Stimulated Fourier mixing and increase the efficiency to make a better photon source? You can. Um, and that's actually how we test it, our devices. So when we're characterizing our devices to see what's the efficiency of it, what's its bandwidth, what's its joint spectral amplitude, like what is the signal and what does the idler look like that are on these, we do it through seeded four wave mixing. Yeah. Yeah. So what were you using the input? So those ones were um, those those eight, the eight dots. Yeah. So those were the outputs of the waveguides, but they would be where the ions would sit. So what those wavelengths are for is that's the cooling wavelengths. So you you hit the ion with it. Um, momentum based on that, you're kicking off momentum from the essentially the atom and your laser cooling them down. So those are the cooling. Uh, blue is the cooling one of them. It's also one of the emission ones, uh, but you can also cool at 455 and there's a couple other transitions. But yeah, so you, you would be doing either collection of 493 and 650, excitation, or cooling. The only thing that I didn't show that you really wouldn't see in this is barium has a hyperfine splitting. It's around five gigahertz. So you can hit two states of that ion. So turn it from an excited to a, a ground. Um, so what you would have also further down the chain before you get to that waveguide end would be a modulator. So you'd be actually adding phase modulated sidebands onto this to hit that hyperfine transition. Yeah. So in the uh, over mixing experiments where you had uh, two bus wave gets coupled to the ring, mm -hmm. you were doing it to be able to independently control the signal idler and the pump coupling, right? Yes. So, and just to clarify, so to get the maximum extraction, you want your signal idler to be over coupled. Yes, you do. But then the pump, are you trying, were you trying to get it to be critically coupled? Is that, is that, was that the goal? So there's two goals with it. One is to get extinction on the pump. Mm -hmm. So that you're going to get as good as you can to a mock sender. So roughly 30 dB. So you're not going to get the 120. You're not going to get the 150, but you'll get 30. Um, for the highest extraction efficiency for the signal idler, yes, you want that overcoupled. For the highest input, you want the pump critically coupled. Now, that's in one configuration. If you want to make what's called a symmetric joint spectral amplitude or joint spectral intensity, where if you were to plot your signal wavelengths and your idler wavelengths, and you want them to be indistinguishable, so you would want that overlap to be round. Yeah, that was my follow-up. You actually want the pump to be overcoupled. So now you have two, yeah, now, now you are at cross purposes, because if you want to head your photon, and the, like you said, if it's not symmetric, you're gonna get into a mixed state. Yeah, well, you would, it, so yes, if you herald off of one, your your state is thermal. So your single photon that's left over is thermal. So it's thermal it, statistics. It would then depend on what you're trying to do next in the chip. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because you're completely right. If you, if you trace out one of them by measuring it, your reduced state is a thermal, has thermal statistics. There are a couple of questions online. Okay. One question is for the barium pick. Uh, are they silicon nitride or aluminum nitride? These are so silicon nitride was the one I showed. And then for the euterbium, it is aluminum nitride for the ions. 
And the second question is what is the physical mechanism behind the 60 dB extension device? So you have a 60 dB extension from, from Dr. Moore. Let me show you. Which I'm trying uh, to think which slide that was. Uh, I, think, I mean, you said it's a 60 dB. Um, you want oh, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, okay. So the one where we didn't get the extension that we wanted. Yeah. The reason actually turned out to be transitions from transverse electric to transverse magnetic modes. So we had yes. um, a lot of the filters were all set up as TE under the bends that were normal in the waveguide. Every bend you generate a small portion of TM light. That TM light will couple over a TE filter, it sees zero extinction. Um, yeah. yeah, and it, it actually just goes right through the filter. And no matter what we did, we hadn't accounted for that. Actually, we hadn't seen anyone account for that. And yeah, it turns out if you design something that passes TM, it passes TM. Any other questions? Either here or online? So regarding the with near infrared transition of ethereum, mm -hmm. but are you mean? Uh, Yep. There's a 2400 nanometer line. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That is one of the lines for your terminal. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's not a very commonly used line, but it is. Oh, not common. <laughs> yeah, but it is a transition line for your terminal. Uh -huh. Yep. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, everyone, for coming.